So what happened, what happened since the last DEF CON in 2019, three years ago, uh, in Osaka? You can see a picture of me there with Fede, uh, the CEO of Kleros, amazing guy, good person. Uh, we were talking about back then, is proof of human possible? You can see the slide there back in 2019. Is a proof of human possible? We were wondering if we were able to do um, a protocol that would be able to formalize human identity on the blockchain. And that would bring us, as you can see on the list there, democracy, universal basic income, portable credit, a lot of very cool social applications. So what happened since 2019? Everything happened. Because a lot of the things that were theoretical, that were just uh, a speculation about how we could do a social identity on the blockchain or how we could do universal basic income became a reality. We have the proof of humanity protocol uh, and the universal basic income token, which is the very first application built on top of proof of humanity. Uh, so today, I'd like to share with you a lot of the very interesting lessons that we faced in these uh, two years building this, uh, col contributing, collaborating, open source, which is the beautiful thing about building things as a community, and uh, to share some of the lessons that we learned in the process. So, a brief recap of what Proof of Humanity is. Uh, it's a protocol, uh, you can generate a brief video of yourself, you get vouched by another human, stake a deposit for three and a half days. If you get challenged, you go to a Kleros Arbitrator. Uh, if, you, if not, you become a verified human on the blockchain, and we are starting to see social applications like UBI, the very first one. Lens Protocol has integrated with Proof of Humanity. Sysmo is doing zero-knowledge NFTs for Proof of Humanity, bringing a privacy layer on top of the civil-resistant registry. And it's amazing. We have, uh, I think, around 17,000 humans verified on Proof of Humanity as of today. Why is this important? If you look at the... Uh, at the World Bank uh, uh, statistics, they claim that out of the 8 billion people that were on this planet, almost 1.5 billion lack an identity. And this is a very common problem, especially here in Latin America. If you go to some of the poorest uh, neighborhoods, you will realize that a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids, they don't have any kind of identity, which means they don't have any kind of access to services, to goods, to, to the state protecting them. So it's a huge problem. And if you look into the conflicts today, we have almost 100 million refugees in the world. These are 100 million people whose right to an identity is being rejected. So, an important thing that we have to take into consideration when we build these systems, and when we think about decentralized identity, is that we need to make these systems resilient enough so they don't discriminate users, so they don't marginalize users and leave people outside of the door. We are fighting Big Brother, and we need to understand that in order to fight Big Brother, we need to understand that in the Web 2 era and in the Web 1 era, the void that the Web protocol has re in relation to identity was captured, was captured by Facebook and the big tech companies in the West, and was captured by the Chinese Communist Party in China. And this has led to the modern forms of surveillance capitalism, where our privacy has been jeopardized and is now in the hands of a handful of corporations. So making sure that we are able to think about identity in a decentralized way, and no big brother, whether, whether that big brother is myself, Clement, or Kleros, or any private organization, or the state, or any entity that can uh, jeopardize our right to identity, uh, is a very important fight. So this is core to, to at least, uh, in my view, to many of the decisions and to many of the political choices that we have made as a DAO. So, the main question I've been hearing since I arrived to DEF CON that everyone asks me is, what's going on with, with the POH drama? Well, uh, we had a democratic summer, kind of analog to the DeFi summer uh, that we saw a couple of years ago with the, with, with the rise of DeFi protocols. Uh, but with proof of humanity, uh, we have the virtue that 
uh, it is the most democratic DAO in existence. I would even go as far as to say it is the most precious democracy we have in the entire internet. Because the proof of humanity protocol allows for formal verification of human identity, we can do one person, one vote. And this has led to a very active, a very engaging DAO where all of our decisions are done democratically, which is a big difference with all of the other DAOs where you do token voting. And they are essentially plutocracies where the largest whales, the largest holders, um, are the ones who are ultimately the decision makers. Democracy helps to put users, helps to give users power, not just the developers, not just the investors, but the users have a voice in a democracy, and that's the virtuous thing about it. A brief recap of the DAO, one person, one vote, allows to delegate the vote, you can do vote delegation. We have quadratic delegations that help empower minorities over delegate whales, and we have three phases of deliberation for proposals. These are the basic rules, quadratic delegations, has been a recent improvement due to a, a farmer of delegations that we identified in the DAO. Uh, and it's a very interesting experiment on how to make a resilient democracy on the blockchain. So, does democracy work? Which is a big question. Uh, you know, making democratic systems, uh, something that I once heard from a, an old activist, uh, a former president of Uruguay, Pepe Mujica, he once said to me that democracy is always a work in progress. Democracy is not an absolute totalitarian idea like all the other ideologies out there. It is the one exception. It is the one idea about how we think about ideas. And it, it's in constant evolution. And democracy is constantly evolving and adapting. Why it's important that we make democratic decisions? Ultimately, high-risk decisions require a high level of legitimacy. The higher the risk, the higher the need for legitimacy. Decisions sometimes are not easy choices. Obviously, we don't go to a vote to make technical choices that are uh, no-brainers. Those decisions are not high risk, are basically, you know, you, you, don't go to a, you don't do a democracy in order to build an airplane. You just trust the airplane engineers to make the decisions for that. You go to democratic votes for the decisions that are facing conflicts of interest, for decisions that have multiple parties with different points of view, and these, these represent very high risks uh, for the outcome of the governance of a DAO, or for the governance of a protocol, or for the parameters of a given system. So high-risk decisions require high legitimacy. There's a new recent article, I highly recommend it. Uh, there's the QR code if, if for those of you who want to, to actually read it. Uh, DAOs are not corporations, and it's Vitalik uh, basically explaining the nature of how uh, democratic decision-making can be very helpful for specific types of decisions in organizations. And he gives this very good uh, analysis of decision types where he claims there are concave uh, worldviews and convex worldviews. Basically, this chart is option A and option B on the x-axis on both charts. And there are concave decisions, are decisions that usually are much better when there, you can negotiate between option A and option B, and the best point is, is this point in the middle where you reach common ground. And these decisions, concave decisions, are much more compatible for democratic decision making because in democracy you have to negotiate. Convex decisions, on the other hand, convex decisions are decisions where it's obviously A or B. Uh, should we vaccinate everybody or should we shouldn't vaccinate everybody? There's no middle ground in the middle in this type of decisions. So it's obviously one or the other, and these are convex, uh, a convex worldview. In the argument of Vitalik, uh, he argues that technical choices are most, more often than not convex decisions, but uh, governance decisions, what he calls sovereign decisions, are usually concave worldviews, and these are much more compatible for democratic decision-making. So, in our DAO, in these 20 months of existence, almost two years, we had a total of 88 voted decisions, uh, which consist of 72 uh, what we call HIPS, Humanity Improvement Proposals, and these had three phases. Uh, the HIPS uh, go through a process of three phases where there's a forum post, a signaling vote, which is kind of reaching quorum if it makes sense to vote this or not, and a binding vote, which is, makes the, the decision 
final and binding. One interesting thing about uh, our DAO is that democracy actually brought engagement. We are, the, the engagement of the DAO has grown over the past 20 months since the beginning, and we are seeing more and more participation uh, as more users engage with proof of humanity and more users engage on trying to uh, have a voice on how we make decisions about human rights on the internet, which is ultimately what a protocol like proof of humanity and many others are trying to figure out. And the fact that we're trying to figure this out with democratic decision making, and it's bringing more engagement, more participation to the DAO, I think it's, it's a very good thing. Usually it's around five to 6% of the registered humans that participate in the DAO. Um, it's, uh, uh, it might not sound like a big number, but when you compare it to the usual participation rates in other DAOs, it's actually a very decent number. The good thing is that uh, engagement is growing. So we analyzed a little bit of the decisions uh, that we took in the DAO uh, throughout the, these 20 months. Half of the decisions we made, almost 50%, are governance decision, uh, mostly related to the governance of the DAO itself. 20% of the decisions are technical decisions, parameters, upgrading parameters of the smart contract or uh, specific uh, uh, decisions related to the technical aspects. 6% uh, were economic decisions uh, related to uh, allocating grants, uh, allocating funds that the DAO has in the treasury and 22% were policy decisions, uh, which means improvements in the policy that is used to evaluate the human uh, applications on proof of humanity. So only the technical ones are mostly convex. Most of the decisions, uh, around 80% of the decisions, are actually concave decisions, decisions that make sense making uh, with a democratic process. So, uh, Another interesting thing is that half of the decisions had at least 85% of voter support. This means that half of the decisions that we took in the DAO, they had one of the options reaching 85% of consensus, which is a very high number. A lot of, half of the decisions had 85% of common ground people agreeing on that decision, whether it's a yes or a no. And even more interestingly, I don't know where I have to point with this, 25% of the decisions one every f out of every four decisions actually had 100% of support, unanimous voter support. These, most of these decisions uh, are, are really interesting because it, you know, people, when they think about democracy, they think, oh, people are going to be disagreeing or people are going to be fighting over things. Turns out that one out of every four decisions have 100% of unanimous voter support on the path to take forward. And the fact that we make the, this, that decision with the community, rather than from an elite of developers showing their back to the community, is actually putting trust in our users. It's putting trust in the people that are helping build this together and not uh, in an ivory tower where you make decisions and you really just don't know what users actually want. So, uh, I have a deeper look about unanimous decisions. I thought initially that they were going to be mostly technical choices. To my surprise, actually the technical choices that had that kind of unanimous support is only 33%. And most of the decisions, uh, around 66%, were actually concave decisions reaching unanimous support. So uh, that's another interesting take, that it's not only the technical choices that might get this, uh, the convex choices, that might get this kind of unanimous uh, support. So those are just some numbers uh, about uh, the drama, about, sorry, about the, the decisions we made in abstract form. But what led to the DAO drama? What led to the, the fighting and the debating and the arguing that we had uh, in Proof of Humanity? Well, this is an old uh, motto from politics. Let's just follow the money. It just follow what's happening with the, the money routes that are uh, within Proof of Humanity. And bottom line is that the role of Kleros in the protocol became a, a decisive factor on how we think about things. Proof of Humanity is a protocol that was initially created by the Kleros team, which is an extraordinary team full of amazing developers, great people. Um, but uh, ultimately, when you start making this protocol subject to democratic governance, Naturally, there will be users that are more inclined to follow the interests of Kleros, usually 
obviously people that belong to the Kleros community, who are P&K holders or who are employees of the company, uh, or you know, obviously the, the core team of Kleros, uh, and the, uh, the community that is native to Proof of Humanity that came to the project because of Proof of Humanity and not necessarily to Kleros, might have different interests than the very interests that Kleros pursues. This is an image from DALI. I leave to your imagination what keywords I used to in order to generate that image. Um, so, to show some stats, we had 652 challenge profiles. These are the profiles that are uh, dubious profiles that might not follow correctly the process to do the proof of humanity video. Uh, of these profiles, we had uh, a total of 153 addresses that acted as challengers of these profiles. Uh, the record month was 146. Uh, so uh, the profile challenging has led uh, to, to, to the whole game around proof of humanity becoming a little bit uh, a far thing from being a fair game. And I'm going to dive deep into this. By the way, on Dune Analytics, there are some numbers that are wrong. Uh, we actually checked the data. So uh, Salva, who did the, the Dune Analytics dashboard, should correct some things. Because of the 652 challenge profiles, uh, we found out that you get, if you get challenged, nine out of 10 times, you will get rejected from the registry. It means that if you are challenged, 90% chances that you're going to get kicked out. You will not be able to defend yourself. And uh, that's a, as a, uh, not a very good thing for the onboarding process for a lot of the users. It's a very risky thing. We looked into the 90% of the profiles that got challenged, and it turns out that 90% of the profiles, the main reason why profiles are challenged, we have the protocol has formalized a couple of states, whether the person is deceased, the person died, the person does not exist, might be a deep fake. The person might be a duplicate, it's a civil attacker, uh, or incorrect submission. The person just didn't follow the steps properly. Well, incorrect submission is 90% of the profiles that get challenged, get challenged for making an incorrect submission, for making a mistake, a simple mistake. And the problem, we have a deeper look, even a deeper look into these on into this, into this submissions, and the, the number one reason is incorrect address. Someone submitted the address and is showing the incorrect address in the video, or it's the address in the video is not matching the address from the submission. A lot of challenges because of the video size, the resolution in pixels of the video. You get rejected for upgrading, uploading a video uh, eight pixels smaller than what is the requirement. Uh, video artifact, no sign, address unreadable, address mismatch. Facial features not visible, like Kevin Owoki looking three quarters. So a closer inspection shows that 90% of the people lost their deposit, which until very recently was 0.1 ETH, which is $600, $500, which is a lot of money, especially in Latin America where we have a lot of users. They got kicked out of the protocol. 90% of the people got kicked out of the protocol for making honest mistakes. Honest mistakes. So, Vitalik said it uh, in our chats. Uh, this, you lose your deposit if you do it wrong mechanism is harsh. It is very harsh and it's not a good look on Web3. It's not a good look on how we are trying to onboard people and give them the right to identity. Malicious challengers exist and they are constantly attacking and taking advantage of the unsuspecting users all the time. And we even have a category, the, a category of users we call bow challengers who are addresses that vouch for someone and then immediately challenge the very person that they have vouched for in order to uh, take their stake. So we have a lot of malicious users. And rejecting tokens, if you're doing, if you're doing this kind of mechanism, mechanism to build a list of tokens or to build a list of objects, you know, that's fine. But rejecting humans for making honest mistakes is discrimination. You are discriminating users because they don't have the skills, the knowledge, or the know-how on how to interact with Web3 protocols. So here's a simple, very rule, very important rule of thumb that I would like to, to enforce into the, our community. Justice is not the same as logic. More often than not, we have in our debates a sort of positivist view on how things should be done. Oh, the person didn't show the, the label properly, didn't follow the steps properly. And uh, it, takes a, it takes a look around, the, uh, around the, the behavior of people which puts logic over justice. 
But justice is very different from logic. Justice means trying to make a system that is fair, that is empathic, that is able to attend uh, and not to punish people for making human mistakes. We're dealing with humans, we're not dealing with robots. And the universe of humans is very different from the universe of robots. So, some of the most controversial changes that we had to the protocol and the DAO, just to give you an example, the very first one was uh, the video resolution thing. Uh, people were getting rejected because videos had 352 pixels of resolution instead of the, recommended three, or the required 360, because WhatsApp apparently crops videos, and uh, people were sharing and testing videos on WhatsApp before uh, uploading them to Proof of Humanity. People getting rejected for eight pixels is not very, very fair. We had, uh, uh, people, we had a very strong debate about allowing people to speak in their own language. Uh, believe it or not, we have a lot of people opposing to making the proof in your very own language. You know, a lot of people don't know English, so we had to actually fight to get people to be able to do the video proof in Spanish. Um, we had to... <laughs> Uh, we, we had our, the Telegram groups, uh, which were built by the community. The community did everything to create not only the official groups, but also the groups that help people to get vouchers, the groups that help people to learn how to make the video, groups that pay for the deposit for users. A lot of groups were built by the community only to one day suddenly find them uh, being captured by the Kleros organization, which led to voting official groups on Telegram and Twitter. And last but not least, uh, we found a user farming delegations, farming almost 180 delegations of profiles that were delegating to this person the very second these profiles were created, uh, which led to a debate around the nature of how we tally delegations. And we came up with a model of quadratic delegations, which uh, incentivizes people to actually delegate to users with fewer delegations and makes delegate whales, like myself, uh, don't have as much power the more delegations they get. Uh, this is a very new idea, and we actually won that one with 70% of the votes. So, if we actually grab the top, top five, these are the top six, I think, we have here, but if we grab the top ten, uh, between the Clero side, the Clero native users, and the Proof of Humanity users, the interesting thing is that the Proof of Humanity community it has begun to win most of the proposals uh, in contrast to the Kleros native community. And this is interesting because Kleros, of course, they created the protocol. They started the whole Proof of Humanity project uh, in collaboration with many researchers, uh, which I was very lucky to be among the very first ones to be con contributing and collaborating on this project. But no single project ever begins decentralized. Nothing begins decentralized. You have to build decentralization and you have to code the, the mechanisms for decentralization over time. And democracy can legitimately help decentralized DAOs. Um, if we look uh, today, at, as of today, as of today you know, if we look at the proposals, proposals started by the community have 79% chances to get approved than proposals started by the creators of the protocol, which is the, the, the Kleros community. So the community has been able to gather power, the users of Proof of Humanity have been able to gather power and uh, put their, the, let, let their voice be heard thanks to democracy. Democracy decentralizes DAOs. This is what we're seeing in Proof of Humanity. Democracy is able to decentralize the power of the uh, elite of developers that might have control over the protocol, might want to try to attempt to have control over the DAO, uh, but ultimately democracy is a good recipe against neo-reactionaries. Neo-reactionaries is this world where users have no choice but to choose whether to go to this elite of developers or to this other elite of developers. It's a feudal model where users have no rights. Only the developers and the elite, the bourgeoisie, get to choose how, uh, what are the rules of the system, what are the rules of the, of the protocol, and users are left voiceless. But if we are democratic, if we build democratic DAOs, users have a voice. Users are able to be heard. And this helps to actually uh, factually decentralize. Decentralize the power, decentralize uh, the, the community, and empower the users over uh, the elite of developers that might try to 
control absolutely everything. So let's talk about uh, uh, the bright side of life. What has led to the growth of proof of humanity? You know, we were uh, roughly 17,000 users right now. It's good to analyze what led to the growth. If we look over time since the launch of the protocol, this is somewhat how the curve looks of user adoption. And the story behind this chart is that we can also look at the history of the price of the UBI token. The UBI token had two big moments. One is during launch. During launch, there was a lot of enthusiasm around the idea of UBI. So we had a lot of uh, uh, curious users that were interested in learning about this token, learning about proof of humanity. And then we had the miraculous day in October last year, a year ago, when Vitalik uh, started buying and burning huge amounts of UBI. And those, those, the, the, Vitalik burn, the Vitalik burn has led to a lot of users interested in proof of humanity and UBI. If we put the two charts together, the proof of humanity being the yellow line and the UBI price being the green line, you know, this is not a novelty in this industry. Price always drives adoption. Uh, price is always an important thing for capturing and, and, and getting users uh, enthusiastic about a technology. So UBI is this simple protocol for universal basic income. It's very straightforward, very simple rules, which requires an effort for the community in order to make this miracle of turning on your phone and getting your basic needs covered uh, happen. UBI is, is a token that is streamed, streamed in real time to verified humans on proof of humanity. It's one UBI per hour per human, or 0.002H UBI per, per second for every human. It streams in real time to your wallet. There are UBI burning dApps and, and games that help burn UBI and build scarcity into the UBI model. It is composable with DeFi protocols. It's an ERC20 token. It can be composed with any kind of protocol. And we had, in these 20 months, over $50 million worth of UBI transactions happening on the blockchain. Uh, one of the most powerful things about universal basic income is that it is the very feature that makes proof of humanity something uh, different than being just a Web3 version of Facebook. Uh, these are some of the real faces of the people that were impacted by the, uh, the power of UBI. When Vitalik burned his tokens and bought like all of the tokens that were available on Uniswap, um, uh, Araceli here, who is an oncology patient she, and a single mother, was able to use the money for UBI to get help for, their can for her cancer treatment. Uh, we had a lot of grandparents, a lot of grandparents using Web3 for the first time. Of course, it might be their, their grandson or it might be a relative that is helping them to use the computer, to be onboarded into Proof of Humanity, but I, I, I really, for the first time in my life, I'm seeing early adopters who belong to the third age, who could be our grandparents, uh, because they are, uh, you know, in countries like Argentina, an alternative like UBI, for the first year, it was actually a very real alternative to the pensions uh, that people get from the state. Um, we had uh, also users that were able to buy the materials to start building their first house. Uh, we had users from all over the world that suddenly found in this idea of universal basic income on the blockchain, uh, in a censorship resistant network, there's a user from Myanmar. Myanmar is going through a dictatorship, through, through a terrible dictatorship, and because Ethereum is censorship resistant, because proof of humanity runs on Ethereum, we are able to reach vulnerable populations that could definitely benefit significantly from having $50 a month or $10 a month, or even in, you know, if Vitalik shows up, uh, $500 a month or $1,000 a month like we had uh, during 2021. So we recently launched ubi.eth. Uh, you can scan the QR code there has all the resources about uh, universal basic income, about everything that we're trying to do with the UBI token. Uh, I'm very excited. We're actually now working on the version two of UBI that allows to use your stream of UBI tokens and break it apart into multiple streams. And you can delegate your stream to someone who need it, need, needs it the most. You can use 10% of your stream for a charity. You can start using that streaming capacity in novel ways. And we're very close to launching this on mainnet. Um, we have applications like the UBI burner. Actually, any ETH that you send to ubi.eth will go straight to the UBI burner. This is an amazing application built by Ruben from Venezuela. 
uh, who you know, fell in love with the project very early on. And uh, it's any smart contract, any, any uh, protocol, anything that works on Ethereum can connect to the UBI burner and use a small percentage fee to burn UBI tokens. And we had even, uh, this one I really like coming from the Kleros community, Prode.eth, which is a sports betting platform. And it uses 3% of the pool, 3% of the price pool uh, to burn UBI tokens. Um, I'll finish very quickly, just very quickly, just one minute, if you're kind enough. I'll uh, give you 15 uh, seconds, yeah, go of for course. it. Of course. Recommendations moving forward. None of the human farms got removed during the challenge period. Challenge period is pointless in proof of humanity. Um, proof of humanity needs to be more accessible. A high deposit is still a high barrier of adoption. People complain about the high deposit, it's not very inclusive. Uh, just make proof of humanity work like a token curated registry. Reward challengers that detect human farms, those are the real enemies, not users making honest mistakes. That's a stupid thing to punish. And universal basic income, income is the proof of humanity killer dab. Let every new proof of humanity registration create organic liquidity and support UBI, which will bring even more users to the protocol. Perfect, Santi. Thank Here you very much. Here is uh, the new version of proof of humanity. Thank you very much.